got a plan. I was like, we're gonna hire a PR person and book meetings and we're not gonna go. Instead, we're just gonna send a lady. We're gonna paint her black and white, butt naked and have her present this box to them without uttering a word as though she's like a character from our universe. My dad worked for KFC, so I was just kind of following the chicken. They started calling me play football in the park. I was so innocent and I, I thought that was just like a swag name for me. So I was like, yeah, mom, like they call me and she's like, ooh. Like. <laughs> when we tested the subs, dust was just raining from the roof. It was super bootleg. To be sweatier is a better. <laughs> yeah, you know, Dude, when, the, when the walls are a little wet afterwards, you're like, ah, yeah. something was accomplished. Call yourself experienced designers, right? Yeah, a little self-indulgent. I did engineering before music, like typical brown kid, just yeah. slamming that. Use like your engineering skills to create these like orbs that when you hit them they light up with will on one side me on the other they, they kind of talk to each other i sampled this oi hoi count all these rupees yeah i'm on it oi hoi so i played it for aisha and she loved it and every time i'd walk by her room when i was home that christmas she would be bumping it and she would always do the oi hoi what's up those my name is ajid today i'm here with member one half of its members is sean chowdhury um Welcome, man. How you doing? Thanks for having me, man. How we doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Um, <clears throat> tell me about your tour, man. You just got started. Yeah. So uh, we are currently doing the Inevitable End Tour, which is uh, kind of a live experience using these two inflatable drums that we made. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we're on. We just did Dallas and Austin last weekend, and we're about to do Chicago, Minneapolis, and then Webster Hall. Uh, in a few weeks, which is, I can't even believe those words are coming out of my yeah. mouth, honestly. Is it feel like the time has come though? Because I know in 2020, when you were doing the original tour, everything got canceled. Right? Yeah, yeah. So it was pretty devastating, honestly, because like 2019 was kind of our like, you know, breakout year or whatever, where mm -hmm. things started moving and we yeah. were actually getting bookings. Um, and we start, we scheduled our first headline tour for 2020, right? Mm -hmm. You know, Feb, which was yeah. <laughs> in hindsight, a pretty wild time to try and schedule a tour. And, uh, you know, we built the instruments for it back in 2018 and had this vision for this kind of live, like immersive theatrical sort of show. Well, you guys call yourself experienced designers, right? Yeah, yeah, a little <laughs> self-indulgent uh, of a title, but you know, um, like I did engineering before music, like typical brown kid, just yeah. slamming math, you know? Uh, but decided to take a U-turn, but still like to apply some of the things I learned, um, you know, in engineering school and stuff to music and mostly in the form of like weird and wonderful experiences and ways to augment like the musical experience. Because for me personally, like it's the one thing I can do anytime and suddenly like time and just perspective like moves differently like I'm so in flow you yeah. know what I mean so I, and I was like wow like this is all happening just through listening and I was like I wonder how I could make it feel like this but also like for other people hearing it for the first time you know like walking walking in the space and really like experiencing the music through more than just their ears was gotcha. kind of the the idea um, and then we've been exploring it in a bunch of different ways and so I know you use like your engineering skills to create these like you're saying these like, drums these orbs that when you hit them they light up yeah now is that sound produced right as you hit them or is it yeah so, pre so they're basically MIDI drums so there's gotcha. four Roland drum uh okay. triggers you can buy off the shelf and they're, they're mapped to MIDI so they can be mapped to any sound yeah. and then we have a custom light interface where we can actually map the envelope of the light to wow. match the envelope of the sound so if it's like an 808 like a doom then the light yeah. will go slower and if it's like a fast sound like a snare or something like a tap then the light will be quick yeah. so that way we kind of thought it's cool because you can visualize the rhythm you know and our music's very very rhythm focused yeah. so with will on one side me on the other they, they kind of talk to each other yeah you know, and we play different parts and sometimes we play the same thing and we just layer sounds and sometimes it's like we play the opposite kind of moment so you can kind of almost see the rhythm like Mm -hmm. talking on stage so uh, since you're in a duo you know and the, all these creative experiences are being uh put together how do you and will go through that process and who takes what role on each side of that yeah i think i'm um i'm definitely a bit more inclined with the weird and wonderful pushing mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> uh, sort of thing and and will is just the best and super like indulgent and he's actually a way better like um percussionist and stuff than i am so it's fun because i help you know, come up with a lot of the designs and stuff. And then we kind of play through them together and try and figure out which parts we want to highlight in the rhythm. And um, yeah, I mean, honestly, 
it's pretty crazy because I met him eight years ago and we just decided to do a random session at my house. And now we've jammed every single day for eight years since, I think. So we're almost at a point where we don't really need to like talk to communicate. We just kind of like get each other. So yeah, I feel like everything is quite a, I don't know, made through symbiosis or something. Yeah, was that <laughs> symbiosis achieved right away or was that something you guys really worked on over the years? And um, It's funny because, so I we used to go to a music school called Dubspot and I jammed gotcha. with just like everybody there because I felt like I learned the most from just other students rather than like class, you know what yeah. I mean? So when Will and I jammed, it was just so on the same page. Like we kind of have the same taste and we were both really moved by like world music and african rhythms and indian rhythms especially so yeah i feel like it was kind of there but through you know four or five years of just being in the same room and really time just does amazing things you know i feel like it kind of uh developed but there was some organic yeah connection there to begin with for sure but it's like truly worldwide because um you're from new delhi right yes and he's from oregon portland Oregon. portland oregon yes how does that happen? How do these two guys from opposite ends of the earth become a music duo that's now touring across the country and playing what, EDC? And- yeah, we're playing, yeah, we got EDC in the books and a, a few others. I, honestly, I think about that a lot. Like, yeah. I've also um, just never lived in a place more than six years. I've kind mm-hmm. of always been hopping all my yeah. life. So I really feel like there is some sort of universal flow or like, destiny sort of thing where certain people and certain energies are like meant to meet and um be together so i i think it wasn't by chance i think it needed to happen you yeah know, for both of us kind of thing and i know you were moving in again back and forth from new delhi to um london right and then back and forth your whole life until you decided to go to college yes yeah, so my dad worked for kfc so i was just kind of following the chicken you know i was yeah, I, I, spent, I spent six years in New Delhi. That's where I was born. I went to Delhi public school, represent for a little bit. And then I moved to England. I went to public school. I got egregiously bullied. So I moved to private school. Um, And then I moved to Holland and went to a British school in Holland and for four years. And then I moved back to India for the last four years of high school. So like 10th grade through senior year. And I went to an American school. So I've been to public, private, international, British, American and Indian school. Mm So I don't know, man, it's like a really, I feel like that's reflected in our music Absolutely. to a large degree, you know, just a little bit of everything in there. Well, with that, you know, I know you do experience moments of racism and like from the, f- there's a film that we'll dive into, but you got Packy a few times and a few other things. How old were you at the time when like you started experiencing <laughs> that? And how do you process that being a kid from India, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was like uh, six and a half, seven and yeah, they called me they started calling me Packy when we played football in the park. And I thought I was so innocent and naive. I thought that was just like a swag name for me. So I was like, yeah, mom, like they call me Packy. And she's like, ooh, like, (laughs) she's like, that's not, that's not a good thing. And then she explained it to me. I was like, shit, man. So I guess I'm different. You know, I didn't really like clock that I was till then. Um, But, you know, I don't know, going through those experiences kind of made me realize a lot in, who I am and who I want to be and made me realize that, you know, other people and cultures can be afraid of just different things. And I think that's kind of stuck with me. It's just like, it was freeing because it's made me realize that I can pick and choose what I want to be. And I don't have to be like their thought of how I should be or how brown people should be in any way. You know what I mean? Well, a lot of the conversation is, I mean, a lot of folks go, oh, I'm too brown for the white or white, white, too white from the brown, which is like, well, that's not really the, the real thing is like, you're just who you are. Yeah. And you're an amalgamation of your experiences and nothing is like invalid, right? No, you said it so well. Yeah, it's it's all about what you've experienced and, and, and kind of where you've been. I feel like there's so many ways to be brown. Like there's so many ways to be white. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah, there's no one stereotype. And I think trying to fit everyone in a box in any way, shape or form is just an atrocious thing to do. Absolutely. Yeah. And so with your life, you know, as I dived into it, I spent a lot of this weekend crying. Like, actually, I was with my girlfriend. We watched this movie that was made about one of your dear family members, your sister. And um, it goes over the tale. It's the movie's called The Sky is Pink. And it kind of covers your experience between your mother and father growing up with your sister who had um, a disease, an immuno... A skid, a, yeah. A severe skid. combined immunodeficiency, severe. which developed into pulmonary fibrosis through mm-hmm. her treatment. Yeah. yeah. 
And it really showed, I think, from their perspective, the grief that parents go through. Um, and it also kind of tapped into like what you were going through, which was like just trying, doing your best to be a good brother, trying to keep your head in the right space. And it kind of sprinkled in your love for music growing up. Um, how do you feel like that experience kind of shaped you either musically or just generally, you know? Honestly, um, just so much. Uh, mm -hmm. Like I'm very, very grateful still, despite how horrible it was um, that, you know, Aisha did get the life she did. So I feel like if she wasn't born into our family with, with my mom and dad, how they are, she wouldn't have even made it to mm -hmm. 18, you know? And mm -hmm. what she did in 18 is more than what most people can do in a lifetime. And uh, I am fortunate in many ways, and I really struggle with survivor's guilt from it mm -hmm. in so many forms. And I'm, you know, still going to therapy and trying to like understand all those parts of myself mm -hmm. and whatever. But uh, I think the, my main takeaways from it were really understanding like mortality and mm -hmm. using the knowledge that, uh, you know, life is limited and everybody will die, but looking at it as a, positive thing rather than a negative thing where that means that like the little trivial fights and yeah. little things that you may be concerned about don't really matter and it kind of puts what matters you know more in perspective and when I was a teenager I really struggled to accept the fact that she was dying because having the the like diagnosis like she has pulmonary mm -hmm. fibrosis uncurable and she's gonna die in five years and I was like 14 mm -hmm. you know so it's like when you're when you're that young trying to digest that thing, I just lost myself in philosophy. I read a lot about existentialism and Buddhism. And I think my main takeaway was that, you know, life is meaningless. And I originally became fully atheist. I was just so angry with the world and with, like, I was like, how can a God let something like that happen to someone so sweet, you know? And meanwhile, I'm still just doing what I'm supposed to do. Like I just yeah. kept trying in school still because I didn't want to be more stressed for my parents, you know? Mm -hmm. So I just really wanted to be like the good kid just rocking steady. So I would kind of, you know, put my head down, do the thing. And I think if Aisha hadn't been in the situation that she was and I hadn't have learned from her death and her life, then I don't think I would have done music yeah. because I, I, I'm I good at school. I was really good at math, just... <laughs> Ding, 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 dude, yeah. just sliding through, you know, uh, all those classes, fine. And I did engineering school and I think I would have probably just rocked steady, you know, and done music on the side because I always found myself attracted to it. But I don't know if I would have had the courage to fully U-turn out of those degrees and be like, I'm just going to make beats every day, yeah. you know, because for an Indian, it's pretty terrifying. You're told Dr. Lawyer always and if you're able to do it, it's like, why not just do it and be peaceful? But I think her life made push me to be me and to really like chase what makes me happy in life, um, yeah. ultimately. You know, in her last three years, she was giving speeches and talks and really inspiring people. Was that kind of the moment for you where you said, I can go do that with what I like to do best? Yeah, I mean, I was still like just struggling on a day to day, especially near the end when she, you know, trying to be in college and like have yeah. fun and go to frat parties when you know that's happening is just really like difficult and strange. And I've definitely got incredibly good at compartmentalizing, but mm -hmm. uh, it was just a really difficult um, like period. And I don't think that's when it happened. I think it was more after she passed away that I, I realized because, you know, I was in the room and like seeing seeing someone that you love like pass away in front of you is something you never forget mm -hmm. you know and almost every moment of every day it's like something that i've learned to live with and now i'm seven years out and i just got a tattoo oh, wow. to <laughs> says for Aisha, yeah. and it even has that we made a little mistake in it and i kept the mistake in it too mm -hmm. and you know this represents a lot for me because it makes me feel like I've accepted my grief. Like I know it's never going anywhere. Yeah. And rather than, cause it has this force that feels paralyzing. Like it grabs you and makes you not want to do anything and makes every little decision and just getting up in the morning difficult. But what I've decided to do is the harder thing, yeah. which is get up and like give it a go. Cause it's like, if I'm going to live, then I want to know that I lived hard and I want to live for her too. And I, it's weird. I feel this connection to her. And sometimes I just know that like, she would be like, oh, just stop. Just like, yeah. cut it out, bro. Just mm -hmm. get in there, you know? Yeah. 
So I try and hold that voice. I try and push myself to do the hard thing. And making music and seeing, going to shows and connecting with people and seeing that it means something to them um, really makes my heart feel full and happy. And yeah. So in this movie, the movie's called Sky is Pink. You created a song for her on the soundtrack called oh, yeah. Aisha. What's it like compart compartmentalizing those feelings of a song that's connected so deeply with everyone on a mainstream level, one, but two, also having, you know, some of the greatest actors in Bollywood, like Farhan Akhtar and Priyanka Chopra, play these parts in your life while also, you know, navigating that grief. Was that something that was hard for you or how did you do oh that? Oh my God. When they asked me to write the song, I was just like, you, you want me to choose notes on this keyboard to choose how I feel about my sister? Yeah. I was like, it's impossible. I literally can't. There's no combination of notes on here that explains how I feel. And I was like, I can't do it. And then my mom was like, you, you need to do it. And I really think that you should and give it a go, you know? And then I spoke to the director, Shanali Bose, and she was really sweet and supportive the whole way and kind of gave me my space to figure it out. And then obviously I went to Will and was like, man, they're asking, they're asking me to write this song for Aisha. I'm terrified, like, like, what should we do? Let's just start writing some beds. So the way I approached it was first, I just wanted to know that the emotion of it, like kind of at least touched towards how I felt. Cause I knew I wasn't going to be able to capture it. So I was like, at least put that expectation away. Yeah. And so I, you know, sat at the keyboard for a while and just tried to pick notes in it. And I was, curious with how can I make it seem happy because so I was like everyone expected to be this sad mournful thing probably but I was like really her life wasn't like that like yeah. she lived hard like for 18 she did so much and that's kind of the energy that I'm trying to channel in my life too so I was like how can I make major sound sad you know yeah. so I was looking and I kind of found the first to the third movement kind of felt the most sad because the third is kind of a minor chord in it so played around and I made like whatever, 16 different ones. And then Will made a couple too. And we like listened to both. And then after a while, I was like, I don't like it. I don't like it. I don't yeah. like it. I don't like it. And then after maybe like, you know, 20, I was like noticed that I was actually writing the same notes in like four or five of them. So I was like, oh, like, okay. So this is what it is. So I just went with what was the most common. And then once I had the bed, I had this idea, which was the oi hoi. Yeah, I wanted to ask about yeah, that. Yeah, so the Oi Hoi is like, it was actually in this rap song called Counting Rupees. So when, when I lived in Brooklyn at the time, I just moved here and I just started doing sessions with Will and we found these two uh, Brooklyn rappers and they came over and we had this beat and it was called Counting All These Rupees, Yeah, I'm On It. Posted on the block, yeah, I'm on it. And it was this really funny, like, Goonie rap song. Terrible mix, terrible beat. But I found this, um, I sampled this Oi Hoi and I put it in the rap beat. So they count all these rupees, yeah, I'm on it. Oi, oi, da 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 da, I'm on it. Oi, oi. So I played it for Aisha and she loved it. And every time I'd walk by her room when I was home that Christmas, she would be bumping it and she would always do the oi, oi. And I just remember like her face, like when she would do that. So I uh, knew, I was like pre-drop right before the chorus, it's going to go oi, oi and then go into something. And then the song kind of like, you know, slowly revealed itself from there. We wrote the chorus and we had the instrumental and then I really wanted the Naran sisters on it. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're having a big moment on TikTok, but before all that, just Highway, the, the album they did with A.R. Rahman, like that was one of my favorite things to be made in recent history. So I was like, is there any chance? And the directors in Sid Roy Kapoor's team was so good that they were able to actually get them. I was just jaw on the floor but they needed, you know, us to kind of write the thing. So yeah. Will and I went in the booth and we're like, just like mumbling through like what the chorus is now. Um, and then we uh, hired this lyricist called Anvita Dutt because my Hindi is good, but I kind of sound like a six year old kid because I left yeah, when I was six. Yeah. So she's really talented, can do Punjabi and all these different languages. So she um, she wrote the Umara Misari Aji Leya and like beautifully expressed what was needed to along the cadence that Will and I kind of like mumbled out. Can you explain what that translates to? It's basically synesthesia. It's like I've lived all the lifetimes. I've tasted everything. I've heard everything. And uh, like, yeah, and like I'm good. You know, it's in the um, the YouTube visualizer. You should probably just run that yeah, for people. That'll probably you. cut it to it clearer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so what was that like for Will's perspective, writing a song that was super sensitive to you, but also 
I guess for him, there, there was some experience on the cultural side, but yeah. what was that? do you yeah. know what his experience was like? I mean, dude, he went through hell and back for me on that one. Like I, so after we had the lyrics and everything, I recorded the English parts with Emmy in New York. We flew yeah. to LA, had some writing sessions there. And then I was like, I have to go to India to finish this. Yeah. Cause I just need to be there. So we went to India, went to Mumbai, hired a studio for a week and like, Will got mad sick. I mean, he the first few days he was good, but we were rocking such late night sessions. We had the Neuron Sisters fly out and recorded in the studio with them. Um, and we had this Basuri flute player come and play through all of the other kind of cadences and, and, and mesh that into the piece, which really added a lot. The sessions were like some I'll never forget. They were yeah. so inspiring and incredible. And we really were onto something in that room. But uh, Will one day ordered some uh, biryani or something from this place. And I didn't get it because I thought it was sus as hell. Well, we but, know. <laughs> yeah, he decided he decided to get it. And I was like, you sure, bro? He's like, yeah, yeah. And he ate it. And then he was out. Like he got some like stomach issue, classic situation. But he was on the couch like this. And like we had two kids choirs come in to sing the part. Because kids choirs are one of my favorite sound in the world. And they mm -hmm. felt like they encapsulated that innocence yeah. that Aisha really had. So he would be on the keyboard, like, yeah, sing, uh, ding, <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> playing sass, like doing all that stuff in the corner while just like KO'd. Um, so yeah, I mean, he's just the best and I couldn't have done it without him or Emmy. Did you anyway. warn him before coming to the country? Like, yo, this I is a possibility. honestly didn't. <laughs> I told him like, <laughs> Jelly Belly's him. part of the experience, bro. Like you may be pooping funny, you know, yeah. it happens to everybody, but it's just whatever. And he's actually really calm about that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Like he doesn't get too uh, stressed preemptively. Mm -hmm. He's not that kind of person, but yeah. even we went and shot schools out as well. Mm -hmm. And in that one, I took him to Dharavi, which is the largest slum in the world. Mm -hmm. And we took him deep in and like we we didn't work with actors we just worked with local kids and like the local people there so he was really literally in the thick of like the dirtiest slums in india yeah. and he hung in there he got sick there as well unfortunately um he like pulled his hamstring or something so he, he has a bad track track record so we need to get back to india and have him have like a relaxing like mm -hmm. pleasure calm trip was school is out his first experience um in india and is it, is it your, both of your first times actually producing a music video in India? Yeah, yeah, that was the first time. What was that like and where did that like inception, what was the inception of that idea? Yeah, I mean, Schools Out was trying to capture like the innocence of childhood, you know, just that that feeling of wonder where the whole world's shiny and, and fresh kind of thing. So we wrote the song um, a while ago and we recorded all these organic sounds. Like there's this one shitty couch in our studio and most of the drums are like us just slapping in the corner of that that couch and layering it with some kick drums. Um, so we were really happy with the with the track and then the foreign family guys loved it. And I told them like my vision for it was always shooting this this story in India where kids find a phone and you kind of follow POV their day, uh, just like, you know, experiencing it. And the guys loved it so much, they were down to kind of fund the idea. And we hired an amazing uh, team out there and just kind of sent it. And Will had never been, so we went to Delhi first, stayed at my house um, and did some sessions with some amazing like local musicians. And it was an amazing trip. Yeah. We still use samples from that to Ooh. this day. You also directed that video? Today? Yes. Yeah. So was that your uh, first, um, was that your first jump into directing? Yeah, it, it really was. That that was the that one honestly was the best one too. I think I've just gone downhill since then. Really? <laughs> Personally, that's what I think. But um, yeah, no, I also had a lot of help. Like we yeah. did that with Sean Kusanagi, who's um, the creative director for Odessa. And he's just such a talented dude and has a lot of experience under his belt. Um, and uh, the crew we had out there, um, this guy Manas, he was also like pretty incredible in front of the camera and taught me a lot. So yeah. it was really learning on the job, but I'm really fascinated with storytelling yeah. um, and like I said like multimedia stuff so I, I, I love getting my fingers you know hands dirty you're an artist everything. you want to be everywhere not just yeah, one thing I like right doing, I like, like getting involved so what's it like for you you know again being from another country moving to America finding a partner uh, in music um, and then dropping music and then being recognized by like the guy, likes of Oseza um, and being supported by people like that you know yeah it's honestly pretty uh pretty surreal like I was the kid at shows just being like oh man imagine if I just got to stand backstage one time yeah. like it would be so legendary and 
Um, I've just been so moved by electronic music mm -hmm. and, and other stuff. Like when I was younger, it was more like screamo metal things. Um, but you know, just shows have really made a big impact on my life. So now being able to be up there and do it consistently is uh, very surreal. I'm pinching myself often. I think now though, late stage career, like not late stage, but further along career where it's like, you've kind of been doing that stuff. Uh, I definitely get a bit more like anxiety around tickets and like are enough people coming and is it as good as it was and I definitely get caught in that mental rat race. A lot. Is it because of that gap because of COVID? Where I honestly think so. Yeah, because it was just like, ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just kind of been like that the whole time, uh, which is fine. I'm just grateful I get to do it at all. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I can writing a song like for Aisha and, and it being received so well is such a relief because I was terrified that I couldn't do it. So the yeah. fact that, you know, it, it really has resonated with a lot of people and we still get messages about it today really is so fulfilling and makes yeah. me feel like I have purpose in my life. So mm -hmm. I'm really grateful to anyone that's listened. Like, thank you mm -hmm. so much. Mm -hmm. And that must be an insane feeling because like, it's such a sensitive thing to be asked and then taking the time to do it, putting flying around the country to do that. And then the song drops and it's part of a movie and you're just like, okay, what's next? Right? Yeah. Yeah. And is that a bittersweet feeling when the song does really well or is it, does it feel great? Cause you know, that, that ode, you, you know, know, that one felt really, that one felt really rewarding that it did well yeah. because it was, it was one where I did like, I know what you're meant to do to get more streams. Like yeah. it should be shorter. You should get to the drop within 40 seconds. Yeah. Blah, -de blah, -de blah, -de blah. Every label says it every time. But with for Aisha, I just chucked all that out the window and was like, how can I make something that feels like how I feel in a more positive perspective, but also something that Aisha would have got down to. Yeah. And that was my main <laughs> North Star was like something I could imagine her in a room being like, oh yeah, like yeah. getting gas. So that one felt like a relief. It's a six minute song. That's like wrong. Like you should yeah. in 2023 make songs that are so long and self-indulgent and winding. But that's also one yeah. of the, gifts of Bollywood. They love a good random bridge. So yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I feel very lucky and very hopeful that that one did well because that makes me feel free. Like I can mm -hmm. kind of write things however, it doesn't have to necessarily be the formula for it to really mm -hmm. rip. It's so multifaceted, like although it's electronic music, it's super Genre cool. Otherwise, we're all over. Yeah. yeah, it's all over, and I love that, right? Because I was listening to Birdhouse on the way here, and I was like, the flute is insane, and I that's was a, like, that's a cheeky one. No one knows about that. Yeah, one. I, 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 it just like came up and I recommended it because I was listening to Union, and then I was like, wait, and I heard the the flute line. What, what's the story of that? Was it actually like recorded or? No, that one was a sample. We we we, we kind of crate dug out, and we had that. It's kind of like a goofy, fun little little beat. And we had that sitting in the vault for so yeah. long. We were always like, we just listened to it, you yeah. know, for fun. So it's just like a fun little vibe, but it never felt like it fit anywhere. And then Foreign Family decided to do this little collection where it was more just about like the songs that never would see the light of day unless they did that collection. Yeah. So we were like, we have one. We That's have awesome. one for you. Yeah. So is it just a given that, at least on your side or for a good chunk of your songs that a Bollywood, not Bollywood, but an Indian influence is going to be in it or? It's more like, like world dance music. I don't want to limit myself mm -hmm. in any way, even with just Indian stuff. Like, obviously I can't not because I'm obsessed with it. And yeah. it's had a, you know, formative uh, role in my life. But uh, I, I like to think of us more as just like world dance music, yeah. you know, like kind of trying to blend things and cultures and sounds in ways that haven't been done before. Yeah. Oh, and you tease us with a little bit of Afrobeats. Yeah, um, exactly. in this last one, I was exactly. like, "Oh shit!" Like, <laughs> no, we've been we've been dabbling with a little like yeah. I've been really liking the Ama piano grooves and uh, mm -hmm. some stuff that's coming out of Africa right now. So we're just kind of you know really curious listeners of of rhythm and 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 what's what's bumping around the world and trying to get vocalists and people that wouldn't usually get on beats like this, you yeah. know, kind of thing. That that stuff really excites me. It feels like I'm in some new untrod uncharted uh, territory. And you do that in the song back online, if you could play it real quick. Um, and like you're saying, it's truly global, but it's futuristic and gritty. <laughs> yeah, this one's cool. Cause it, it, it's like, you know, we wrote this with a lot of different friends. So my wife, Evan Gia is singing on it. And she actually wasn't on it at first. It was a collaboration between us, Russian artist Bikla and uh, LA based um, producer Pluko, yeah. who's also on Foreign Family and a good friend. So we, we've been writing with Pluka for ages and we got in a session and we accidentally messed up and booked two and Bikla was also coming. So we're like, oh, let's just all do it together. Yeah.
<laughs> it's just head bang. Yeah, it just proves it. This also has a nice like yeah. UK kind of like two step garage feel to yeah. it, which which, I, which I'm into a lot right now. Um, but yeah, so you know, Pluko, Bikla, me and Will, we all just kind of cooking and throwing ideas at the wall, and the boom ba dam boom ba dam yeah. played, and we all just go <laughs> immediately. Wow. That was Will. He ripped that little line and we all just paused and we're like, okay, like yeah. that feels like something. So we kind of honed in on that um, and kind of got the rough bed. The outro is actually what the drop was. Yeah. So that used to be the drop and then we kind of took it away. And I love like reshaping ideas yeah. to hear like different ways that they could kind of sit because context and what came before actually matters a lot, you know? So reshuffled a lot and then Emmy heard it through, through cause she, she works downstairs we work upstairs. We heard it through the wall. It was like, what's that one though? She's like, yeah. I think I may have to write to that one. I was like, all right, all right, go on. So we sent her the thing and she and she's the one who kind of got the line of like, you put me back online and that was it. We were like, okay, like this is yeah. this is a lock. And that's when the the through line for the song came through. We're like, oh, we're back online. Yeah, exactly. Let's say post COVID, post the internet, you know, yep. creating music together. Exactly. Oh, that was it. It used to just be called online. And then she made it back online. I was like, yeah. that's what it was meant to be that the whole time, dude. But that that's the beauty of union is like these ideas that maybe Will and I wouldn't have got to, you know, without all these external influences. And I really wanted to try and use and work with people that uh, have completely different perspective and cultural backgrounds. So I just feel like that adds even more spice mm -hmm. and masala up in the mix. And is that why you guys made an EP? Because you were experimenting with all these different exactly, worlds? Exactly, yeah. Because we were like, okay, like let's just spend some time like really diving in and see like a new way to do things. And we're kind of uh, finally gearing up to work on our debut album. And, you know, we've taken a long time not like to wait because we were like, we wanted to make sure we're good at our craft, you know, and like, feel like we can express ourselves properly. And at this point, we've been doing it together for eight years and alone for over a decade in terms of just writing music. So I feel like we've definitely put our 10,000 hours, maybe times five in. So definitely. yeah, so I think I think we're, we're I think we're finally ready. So Union was kind of our baby exploration of this world dance thing mm -hmm. and trying to get other insights. And now yeah. I think we're gonna, we're gonna bunker in and start cooking on the next gotcha. era. Yeah, because I'd say your fans would be like, considering the live experiences you've created, um, the music you've created, that the album is like a no-brainer at this point. Um, and, you know, one thing I want to touch on is a part of those live experiences is not just like an immersive listening party or the drums, but even your marketing campaigns are fucking insane. Oh, um, thanks, man. Like, you had a, a box, right, with different scents and flavors, and yeah. you had a naked kind of woman <laughs> painted all in body paint, running around New York, speech just going to what different magazines, paper magazine and different publications to hand this box over. So th um, I think where we were in our career is pretty important. So this was our first EP. Yeah. It's literally Saga One. And it was three songs and each song was paired with something you tasted, smelled and uh, drank. And it had this alien voice and a USB and three vials in it. So you yeah. put the USB in and it talked you through how to consume them. And as you listen, you were kind of drinking and tasting mm -hmm. these things. So that was like, you know, kind of off what I, what I mentioned earlier, just about trying to experience music through more senses and kind of like immerse yourself into that first listen. Because I feel like the first time you listen to a song, like ties memories for me, yeah. you know, like, I don't know, like when I was in high school, hearing like this is a stupid one but like the way i are or like something you know yeah. and being at, at the first time i heard that was at a friend's house party and it's just i don't know those moments like stick with you forever so i was like the first isn't so important so how yeah. can we like augment this even more and i was like if you tie this is getting a little literal but uh in your brain when you smell things the 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 smell center is really close to the memory center mm -hmm. so i was just trying to like think through ways to really make that first listen like super special and memorable so we made this ep and we handmade 50 boxes. So Will and I yeah. sat there, we filled each vial, fill, like put the song on each USB, bought boxes, put stickers. It took so long of manual labor like for him and me to do. And then after we finished it, we were like, shit, so no one really wants these, dude. <laughs> like, what do we do <laughs> yeah. with these? Like we made like seven yeah. of these boxes. So I was like, shit, we need to like, how do we get the word out? And like, just no one really knew about Memo, it was so early. So I was like, I've got a plan. I was like, we're going to hire a PR person and book meetings and we're not going to go. Instead, we're just going to send a lady. We're going to paint her black and white, butt naked, 
and have her present this box to them without uttering a word as though she's like a character from our universe. So it was kind of, you know, that was kind of the thinking behind it. And then we went with her. It was really fun because we just wait outside. And yeah. She'd go in. And some of them, like, really didn't like it. Like, the People magazine guy was not about it whatsoever. And it was absolutely hilarious. But uh, the Paper magazine people really liked it. I mean, they didn't end up really writing about it. But it got their attention, you know. And, yeah, yeah I don't know. It was just a really uh, fun gorilla marketing way and I think that's something for anyone who's you know writing music and is so proud of their thing and wants to like get it out there just like don't do what everyone else does like you know take a step back and think about something that would get you excited and and be fun and be like crazy you know if it feels crazy to you and when you tell your friends their eyes light up about it you're probably onto something so yeah maybe think like that and maybe it'll help like you know yeah get something going and i'm assuming is all those things baked in from the marketing to the products to the music um into the next project or the way you want to market it or is that something still you're thinking about um well we did this immersive party for union mm -hmm. so it's kind of we're still on our antics a little bit um back on the bullshit but uh yeah the, the la immersive event was really special like we were able to take this idea we actually did our first run of that immersive party in brooklyn back in 20 18 yeah um yeah and to do an la leveled up was pretty incredible like we we partnered with brownies and lemonade and it's awesome the immersive arts collective in la and managed to raise some funds to support the immersive arts which was kind of like fulfilling and uh yeah there was all these different rooms and you had to walk through and interact with all these characters and if you interact with them right they'd give you a symbol and once you got three symbols you'd go into a room where this dude led you through a wardrobe you go through the wardrobe and then you had an intimate listening party with like 10 people where the EP was listed in front of you and you got to pick one song to listen to. So it was a, again an attempt yeah. to make the first listen really memorable and special because you're never going to forget I heard Skybender through a wardrobe with these 10 random people and we were all just getting down and dirty together, you know. Yeah. Um, and then we did a show where we showcased the new show and just tested everything out um, in a tiny sweaty room where there'd never been a show done in there before. When we tested the subs, dust was just raining from the roof. Wow. It was super bootleg and yeah. really fun. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like, <laughs> I don't know for most people, but to me, sweatier is a better. Yeah, <laughs> you know? Dude, when, the, when the walls are a little wet afterwards, you're like, ah, yeah. something was something was accomplished. Or if like, there's like too much fog in the room, you're like, oh, oh no, I definitely, yeah. I've realized now, I've told my team, keep the fog machine away from me because I think I really? over fog that. <laughs> <laughs> like I just kept hitting it every every drop, and I think I need to. I that needs to be taken. It's just away a red me. button. It's yeah, just it's just too tempting, it. dude. Yeah, <laughs> I want to jump into one uh, other song in the EP. I really love. It's called "Apply the Pressure," oh. um, where you get rappers on. Yeah, and I think it's my favorite dude, one, Don, dude. That's your favorite. Yeah, like it's that, definitely my favorite. Thing. Let's go. Um, and you had uh, yeah, Party Future and Vindon on it, um, and it's just <laughs> yeah, I I just. <laughs> Just want to know the story behind it. Yeah, gun or anthem, man. Um, I just remember when I lived in England, we used to go out to these raves and there'd be these drum and bass lines and everyone would dance like this, you know? Mm -hmm. Like that kind of thing. And you always have the yeah. just the filthiest stank face on. Yeah. So we did a session with Party Favorite in, in LA and uh, we had this whole song and it was actually a rap song. Really? Sorry. <laughs> All right, we'll rep it. Yeah, it just gets it's, you. Because it, <laughs> it dives into the whoops, but it's also just like the beat is just still there and just it's, so steady, it keeps dude. driving yeah. you towards it. DNB fundamentals. Yeah. Yeah, it was like, we, I just realized like, oh shit, we never actually made a drum and bass song. And yeah. I just remember that that era of, of childhood and just being so into the the gurner anthems. That's what I, that's what we called them back then, yeah. you know, the, gur, the gurner beats. So with um with Party Favor, this was a whole rap song. So Vin Don did like, four verses, like a hook, like so much stuff. And it was over a rap beat that we sent him like years ago. Yeah. And we always had the acapella, but we were like, our beat kind of sucks. So we just kept the acapella and we played it for Party Favor. And he was like, dude, I feel like we should just take just a little piece, just a little piece. So then we started chopping it, chopping it, looking, looking. And then we found, we found that. And we were like, oh, this gets it going immediately. So the rest of the song flowed really quick. Yeah. Like we had uh, apply the pressure, apply the pressure going. And then we hit the drop and uh, jacked it up to DMB tempo. 
And um, yeah, the rest is kind of history, dude. That's it. Every time we play it out too, it's really fun. I love the halftime drop in the middle too, because mm -hmm. that makes you want to kind of Bernie lean back on it. Yeah. And then when the last one comes around, it feels really like mm -hmm. exciting because you've had to wait actually two minutes for yeah. it. And what's crazy because it subverts expectations because the, the, you know, it's coming up, it's coming up. And then a lot of people expect something. Like, yeah. <laughs> but then it's just drum beat. Just, and, it's yeah. like, and it's like, oh shit, I got to get back in the, oh, in the mood for it. Oh, I'm glad um, you like that one, man. Yeah. What's your favorite one? to perform Ooh. from the new project <sighs> tough to say tough to choose between children through the ceiling is a perfect rail banger where we mm -hmm. made it to be the like in america i've noticed people love doing this dance you know what I, mean? I don't know who americans told, are not a dance i don't know why. who told everyone about <laughs> the rail dance but people love it and sometimes it's funny like we'll be playing like mumbai mode or something that's a bit more up tempo and people are still trying to rail ride but it's not quite yeah. the right beat so i was like we need to have one on there that's just perfect so they can just snap it in half when they get out there and through this thing is ba 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 Ba, 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 you know, so it's so it's perfect for that. So that one always feels good because I feel like people just well, people in America especially just know how to dance and lock into that one. Yeah. So that one feels good. Apply the pressure always feels good. And surprisingly, well, back online is like a bit of a chill cruiser, but people have been singing it recently. Like at the Dallas and Austin shows, people are actually singing it back. Yeah. And there's no better feeling, mm -hmm. honestly. Yeah. When it comes to like writing the music, and actually I want to dive into this, you make a lot of your music with your wife. Yeah. Um, how does that, how did that relationship start and how did that become a musical dynamic or was it the other way around at first? Yeah, it was the other, it, there was no, Emmy wasn't doing music really when we met, which is kind of nice. Um, but yeah, the, it's kind of crazy. So like Aisha passed away, uh, January, 2015. And then, um, I, Will and I started member like middle of 2015 and I started dating Emmy middle of 2015. So it was like out of the worst experience of my le life, um, the universe gave me two gifts that literally are the most important things in 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 my whole life. So yeah. I was lucky. And yeah, I, I was already kind of like, Emmy and I were hanging for a long time before that, but we kind of made it official um, then. And she actually went to Berkeley and wow. she is a operatically trained singer. She's so good at singing, it's insane. And like had such amazing body awareness. And mm -hmm. like when she talks to a singing teacher, they're talking about stuff I can't even understand a little bit. Um, but going to Berkeley kind of like made her feel a little like, I don't know, less than because people are just so good that Charlie Pluth was in her class and you know, yeah. Berkeley just bigs up whoever's the, yeah. whatever, the, the star of the class and whatever. So she ended up switching to music business. And then she was actually working at um, Sterling Sound, which is a mixing and mastering firm in New York when I met mm -hmm. her at, at, the, at the reception. So she was not liking it. And yeah. uh, you know, we started dating and she saw me going for the member thing while studying so my visa ran out, so I had to go to NYU just to oh, wow. be able to stay in the country. No way. So yeah, I did my master at NYU and was doing starting member. And um, yeah, she she was like, maybe I should do this too. And we were like, yes, you should absolutely do this. So we started writing songs together just for fun and for member things. And uh, yeah, honestly, terrible songs. So many terrible, mm. terrible songs together. It was really fun. And uh, she eventually was like, okay, I'm gonna quit this, do flywheel, like be a fitness instructor and do music and Evan Gia was born like around 20s 20, and 2016 2017 so like a year or so after or a year and a half after we started dating was that with Westworld or was it uh so her first big song was Westworld but we had a few like absolute zero and stepping stones like a couple of other tracks before that some that are better not to be named yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah Westworld was the first one we got signed to a label foreign family mm -hmm. and that song really just set her off what was it like to know that your girlfriend and now wife, you guys get to share some of the, your most successful songs together. Does that tribe feeling get stronger because of that or? No, really. There was this one moment, Capitol Hill block party, where she had me come out and it was just outside. The whole block was packed and everybody seemed to know the words. There's people hanging out the window. And it was one of the most incredible and surreal moments of my life that that, that moment really felt like, wow, like we're really doing this together. Um, otherwise, on a day-to-day, -day, you know, being creative with your partner is 
amazing but also can be uh, a little tumultuous if you're not careful because i'm also terribly honest like if i don't like something i can't help it i just have to say it yeah and uh you know that could get tough but luckily we have will who's our peacekeeper in the middle <laughs> so it, it, our dynamic with the three of us uh works super well, well will's getting well trained at this point oh yeah he's good he's like all right you guys need to chill yeah. <laughs> and uh, we're gonna sort this out but the key is not letting it bleed over into you know our actual life right. uh outside of the studio and we're getting we're good sometimes it happens but overall we're, we're, we're pretty good That's about true. it and it's because we all just care so much yeah you know? so it comes from us all wanting to make the best art that we can make kind of naturally like. right and i'm yeah. sure that could also happen with like you and will sometime to, oh, oh time, yeah right yeah um and so but what's special about it to me is like most people, when they have an excess, their partner is there to share the moment with them as a fan, right? Or as someone who's like, oh, wow, why she work so hard? But I'm assuming, tell me wrong, when you looked at her, you're like, we share this moment. Yeah, um, no, it's pretty incredible. It's also like we can um, relate to tour life and like, you know, when you need some time or when it's just like, just the, the, the little bits that maybe if your partner wasn't in it directly, maybe you wouldn't understand, be like, hey, like, why aren't you in touch? Why isn't this happening? It's like, well, it's just been so hectic and, you know, we really can empathize with each other. Yeah. So it really helps like our relationship. The one bummer is when we're both on tour, it mm -hmm. can be like two ships in the night, you know, but we yeah. try to make a two week rule, two week rule mm -hmm. where, you know, we don't let it go beyond two weeks without seeing each other. So even if that means another flight, which is kind of the last thing you want to do when you're yeah. touring, but we, 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 we've made that thing and, and it really, kind of helps things. yeah so is that a rule you guys came up with after like let's say a certain amount of time like, yeah this needs yeah to happen? yeah especially because she she tours even more than we do so really? you know with her being gone and then her coming back and then me being gone we were like all right we gotta yeah. we can't let this keep happening so we go support each other all the time and it's kind of fun because yeah. it's it's also like you know like edc like i went to sport her, but we also got to go on stage on one of the biggest places ever so yeah. uh yeah we're really lucky what's that like creating uh, that structure with a partner when I'm assuming not a lot of people you know are in that position or have, do you no. have people that you can actually give you advice and stuff like that as you were, were doing it at the same time? No, so far there's not that many people that we've met that are doing it and successfully able to keep doing it because we, we've fully gone and got married, you know, so yeah. we're locked in for life now. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think the only other couple that I know that's married that's super steady and both doing music is Elephant Heart. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you've heard of them, but we're working on a few songs with them. They're amazing. Um, and they seem to be able to rock it well. But yeah, generally, I feel like the odds aren't the best for like artist yeah. relationship couples. <laughs> but I think we have a touch wood. We have a, we have a good thing going. Yeah. And it's funny. I found out a big chunk of the story and actually for, about for Aisha because she made a TikTok about your guys' Thank God for her. I'd never, like, Will and I just don't take the time to do that ever. And yeah. she's way better at the TikTok storytelling. So I feel like a lot of people have been learning about the story through through mm -hmm. her. So thank God she yeah. does that. Also, the wedding, our wedding went viral, which was pretty It did. Ridiculous. My girlfriend, I started just like, I've seen this song. Really? really? I was no just like, and then I showed her the song. She's like, I already know this song. I'm like, no way, dude. And um, I, I do want to dive into those beats that you brought yeah, with us. Yeah, I want to show you a couple of things we've been cooking. Yeah, let's jump into that real quick. So you got you right. said Punjabi beats, right? Yeah, so, uh, you know, we we take blending, blending styles kind of seriously over here. And Punjabi folk, like my, my mom's kind of, you know, half Punjabi and I have a good bit of Punjabi in me and I feel like Punjabis know how to get parties going, you know what yeah. I mean? So we've been trying to get the Punjabi hip hop vibe right for a bit. So we've been cooking on these two tracks. This, this one is a little more fleshed out. At the moment it's called Paji, working title. Um, but yeah, check it out. I don't know, if, I guess I'm just gonna do yeah. Paji. Is this the most you've ever dived into Punjabi yeah, music? Yeah, yeah, definitely. You got the Sidhu shirt on too. Yeah, I got the Sidhu dude yeah. representing hard. I mean, like this sound to me is just so hype. Yeah. And I feel like there's so much opportunity here, especially like living in America and having like American hip hop beat standards. You know, hopes I feel like in, in a lot of Punjabi folk, the stuff that's being made, the beats sound like kind of bland in how I'd want them to. So we've been taking this seriously and we add our own wonky. You know, we add, we add yeah. some source to that kind of thing. So I've never heard it the way I've kind of envisioned it in my head. So we've been 
slow, quietly cooking on this for like a year or so, getting this sound right. And finally, I feel like this is starting to shape into something. So this other one, this one's called Monday Gone Mad. And uh, it's featuring Jussie, who's a pretty amazing uh, Punjabi folk OG. Yeah. And he literally, we sent him this beat. The mix is god awful, so I apologize in advance. No and he literally just mumbled it on his phone. So these vocals are mostly gibberish, but I just want to show you, give yeah. you a taste. <laughs> How do you go about like finding these artists? Dude, Jussie's amazing. I gotta hold on to this. Yeah, this, yeah. This one's gas. But so he he actually I got connected to him through my dad. My dad went yeah. to a wedding in India and is obviously always picking up. And I've told him I'm like you're on the hunt. Any Punjabi folk stuff, you gotta connect me immediately. So yeah. he actually met Jussie and they started chatting. And Jussie wanted me to work with his son, but I was like, Jussie, man, I wanna work with you, mate, please. <laughs> so I was like, he was like, okay, send me some beats. So we waited three months, we were cooking, cooking, and then this kind of one snapped in. And uh, we sent it to him and he immediately, I got a, I got a video of him in the car, just da -da 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 -da, you know, just going yeah. off the minute he heard it. So he mumbled that out real quick, but it's really funny. Often when we work with Indian folk people, we're getting six bars and we're getting two bars. And we're just getting bits and pieces. Like the yeah. flow isn't like Western style, like fours and eights. And I guess maybe I've got conditioned to that way of listening. And that's kind of my expectation when I'm listening to the flow. So um, I just take it and cut up the syllables and make it into flows that feel a bit more, uh, I don't know, like Western framing. Yeah. And then I sent it back to him with all his mumbles and we're like, can you like, double that part, add extra words here. So this is kind of just a sketch, you know, of yeah. how it could be. So he's really into the flow now. So now he's rewriting lyrics and he's gonna send some vocals over. And then I think what I'm gonna do is delete everything and then have some U, uh, like US rappers go over it and then blend it together, you know, and try and get, uh, I don't know if you've heard that song by Steel Bangles, Sid Who, um, called 47. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, I love that track. That track really like we play it as our like um in between song before we play our shows every time. Yeah. And it just has such a like it has UK, it has Punjab, it has everything that I love in music in one. So kind of inspired by that, uh, we were thinking of trying to make this like global, global Punjabi folk vibe, you know? Wow. Spread that's... the sound. Because I feel like you can spread the sound further, you know, when it when it's got more languages mm -hmm. and and that's truly just your experience, right? Yeah, yeah. It's also just how I grew up. So is, I just like variety. Is this something that's going to be a part of the new project, you think? Or do you think this is an ancillary? Dude, like, I don't even thing? know. Because we were actually going to... The first one I played, uh, the Paji track, that's featuring Samir Gill, who's an Australian um, um, wow. Siddharji. And he's like absolutely unbelievable. Got connected to him randomly through WhatsApp as well. Um, but yeah, uh, I don't know. We were, we were actually going to go on tour in India, but I haven't got my visa. Mm -hmm. So I haven't been able to leave the country for like over a year because the whole US government's backed up. Are you what? Are you citizenship? Do you have? I'm technically British, which is very confusing. So yeah. I, I have an English UK passport, but I have yeah. OCI card, um, which is like overseas Indian. So I can mm -hmm. like, you know, go to India anytime. Gotcha. But the problem is to stay in America. If I leave, I can't come back to America. So I'm actually since uh, I mean, I just got married. I applied for a green card. Nice. So till I get the green card, I can't leave. So gotcha. it's just a lot of bullshit, but it's real. It's a big bummer because we actually had Sunburn booked. We were going to headline one of the third stages wow. and we were going to drop this song as like a warm up to the, yeah. you know, coming to India finally because we haven't actually got to go to India since Fraisha came out. Wow. Yeah. So I'm just dying to see what it's like there now, you know, and I also haven't seen my family. So I'm, I'm, I'm like itching to go the minute I get my green card approved. I'm going home and we're going to rip some shows, hopefully. So, yeah, the. They were going to come out and then visa issues. So I don't quite know what's yeah. going to happen to it. So them. right now you're still Brooklyn bound. Yeah, still, you, still living out in Brooklyn. Do you consider yourself like a, how can I explain? Do you consider yourself a Brooklyn guy through and through now? Or? <laughs> I don't, I'm never from, I'm never from where I'm at. That's yeah. how I feel. Um, but 
Yeah, I, it's, I was just thinking, I've spent 10 years in India, 10 years in England, and 10 years in America. Yeah. So I'm literally an even pie right now. So, yeah. What feels most like home to you? Or is that an unfair question to ask? Ooh. I guess home is just where I'm currently posted up. You know, it can change at any time. It's more about the people there. Like where Emmy is, is probably home. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Brooklyn's feeling good right now. Yeah. I honestly love Brooklyn. So we just opened a new studio. It's yes. called Antenna. And I would love to show you guys it somehow. But uh, yeah, like we're going to try and have other people come through, artist friends, and kind of make it into a community spot, do workshops. I really want to like work with other up and coming producers and connect with more those artists, you know, in New yeah. York and really make Antenna like a hub in the scene over here. That'd be incredible, man. I mean, I know for me, this is like creating, you know, like a those community of like diasporic artists. Uh, finding a hub in New York is a bit harder for a lot of people. Dude, Antenna, man. Say no you know? more. Yeah. So if like the Nintendo plug is here. It's uh, here, dude. The Nintendo plug is here. It's here, yeah. And it just opened? Literally, we first day with all the speakers and everything set up was yesterday. So I'm itching after this. I'm running straight there. I'm going to get cooking. I'm really excited. That's fire, man. I can't wait to see it, dude. Yeah. Um, what part of the U.S. was your favorite so far living here? Um... I do have a love for for Brooklyn and New York. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's just absolutely uh, just one of the best. It's like a playground for young adults. Yeah. You know, you can just run it. Everything is walking distance. Um, I, I don't want to live anywhere else. Um, LA is tempting. Um, I love the weather out there. There's almost too much to do, so much music stuff. Uh, but I think being posted up, kind of feeling like we're doing our own thing over here. And it's, it's kind of nice. Easy to hop, skip, and jump. Hop to London, skip. Yeah, to Yeah, you, you can. It's true. You can get back to Europe and, and Asia way easier. Yeah, from there. that's fire. And I'm assuming. Do you know how to drive? Because you were in big cities your whole life. <laughs> Dude, I failed my driving test mad times, but I got it, man. Yeah. Uh, how old were you when you got it? Here. Oh, don't, don't even <laughs> say it. Dude. It's it. 29, brother. 29. Yeah. Dude. Wait, didn't your wife dude, make what's a TikTok? Will's excuse this? though? He's not here. I usually try and pawn the pawn the thing onto him when he's here because wait, uh, he just didn't have one. No, he he got it same time, but he was also well. He's younger than me, so he whatever. He was like yeah. whatever, 26, 27. But um, yeah, man, like for me, it was because I went to uni here. I had my driving license in India and then I just never bothered. It's just like New York, you don't need it. Uni, you don't really need it, you know? Yeah. But uh, yeah, I'm happy to finally be mobile. Wait, he didn't have a, a car in Portland? He just, Dude, no, he just chilled, man. Just I don't chilled, know. Made music. And then he came to New York and was just posted up. So he got the New York excuse as well. But yeah, the boys were not mobile for a long time. We had our homies driving us to every show. Yeah. They kind of liked it though, because they got to, you know, pull up free and we were just like having a good time but yeah now they can't be mad when they get geo right? yeah <laughs> you know? exactly well man you two are creating this world wave um hitting every t- different touch point of the earth like you're saying an australian punjabi person <laughs> um making music from london to new delhi to brooklyn um thank you for coming on dude seriously it's a pleasure no you're um, doing amazing things for the culture man I really appreciate you having me thank appreciate you it, man do you have uh, any words to um, send off with Thank you guys. If you've ever listened to a member song uh, in any way, shape or form, like because of you, you know, we get to do this and it's not lost on me. I know how short life is and getting to do this means everything. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you, man. Appreciate you coming on. Cool.